Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. In our last episode, we looked at the largest ships in science fiction films. Today we're going to be doing the same thing, but with space stations. To simplify things, we won't be covering video games unless they had a motion picture, so no Citadel, but yes to Halo. Also, we won't be looking at novels or TV shows like The Expanse or Babylon 5, only sci-fi franchises that have films. We're also looking at completely man-made or begrudgingly alien-made structures, so no nowheres or Starkiller bases. And for everyone who's been complaining about my lack of Star Trek knowledge, well, we have a special guest today who will remedy that situation. Anyway, let's begin. So we're going to start off in familiar territory with the Star Wars franchise, but we'll be talking about a space station that probably only diehard fans really know about, the Starforge. This massive construct was created by the ancient Rakan Infinite Empire more than 30,000 years before Luke had relations with his sister and created the dark side ancestral being known as Kylo Ren. Unlike the Death Star, the Rakan Starforge was all about creation. It was like one giant Star Trek replicator. You just placed things inside of it and it could make infinite copies of it. That's how the fallen Jedi Revan was able to create a gigantic fleet out of thin air. So how did the Starforge work? Well, it ran on dark side force energy, which is probably one of the more evil renewable resources on this side of putting baby seals into a furnace for steam power. Anyway, we don't really have real specs on how big the forge was, but some fans took a look at some of the shots of the forge from Kotar, a masterpiece from Bioware, before the godless entity known as EA clamped onto its flesh and sucked out all of its life force for some short-term profit. The fans figured out that if the hammerhead cruisers in the scene are 315 meters long, then the Star Forge is roughly around 28 kilometers long and 11 kilometers wide, making it many times smaller than a Death Star, but arguably a lot more useful. If 30 Rebel Stump Fighters can take out one Death Star, just imagine what a factory capable of making infinite amount of X-Wings can do. Next up, we'll be talking about one of the prettiest space stations on this list, and because it was from the other series that starts in Star and ends in J.J. Abrams, we'll be bringing back former Federation captain and Generation film alumni, British Ben. Well, Alan, the next Star Trek movie is going to be directed by Quentin Tarantino, so J.J. Abrams has ended to the release of some, and now we're going to get a Star Trek movie that has volumes and chapters and lots of superfluous dialogue, as well as horror movie-style phaser wounds. Quentin Tarantino has been allowed to direct the first ever R-rated Star Trek movie. So Starbase Yorktown featured in the Justin Lin Star Trek movie, Star Trek Beyond. That was the movie that made my wife go into labor with our first child. That's no joke, she literally went into labor during the movie. She stayed for the end of the movie though, and then we drove to the hospital. Anyway, it's best described like this. Looks like a damn snow globe in space, just waiting to break. Oh, that's the spirit bones. So this snow globe was actually a Federation outpost on the edge of Federation space where many different species lived and interacted. The Federation didn't want to show favoritism for any one species, which is why they didn't just rent some space on some planet for the base. The base featured multiple rings with skyscrapers, parks, lakes, trains, and what looked like an Apple store all built within its internal atmosphere protected by an energy shield. Although they never mention the size of the Yorktown in the movie, the concept artist that designed it says it is between 56 and 64 kilometers or 35 and 40 miles in diameter. And for some reason, the Yorktown has a mini Death Star at its core. Give me schematic of Yorktown. There, Yorktown headquarters. I always knew the Federation was evil. Anyway, the Yorktown is very similar in design and even a similar size to our next space station. So back to you, Alan. All right, Ben, cool, thanks. We're probably gonna need you at least one more time before this video finishes. Anyway, before we do that, we're gonna move on to another alternative reality of Earth by looking at the film Elysium. In this timeline, the majority of humanity is confined to overcrowded favelas on Earth while the richest humans inhabit a utopia high in orbit. Cue simplistic dumbed-down commentary about wealth disparity in the world with a predictable and misguided end conclusion that violent class struggle is the only way forward. Luckily, the space station Elysium can heal all ailments, and hopefully maybe even extremism. But what makes Elysium Station really cool is that it's based off a structure known as the O'Neill Cylinder. Keep this term in mind because we're probably going to see it at least once or twice more in this video. 
An O'Neill cylinder was a space station concept devised by American physicist Gerard K. O'Neill. The cylinders were giant capsules that were several miles long and were constantly rotating, generating gravity for the inside of the structure, which usually had massive agricultural works and housing complexes. The reason O'Neill created this design was he wanted to make space travel more desirable, especially if humanity was going to take longer interstellar journeys. Living in a tiny capsule for a few months is tough enough, but for the type of voyages we'll need to take in the future to far off stars to conquer other alien races and strip mine their planets, we might find ourselves stuck in generation ships that will have to be more accommodating to the human psyche and mental health. This means blue sky, green grass, and large open spaces. Elysium is exactly that, just not as a vessel for space travel, but as a permanent living situation. Again, we're not given exact measurements, but production notes state that the station has a diameter of 60 kilometers and the ring has a thickness of two kilometers. Now, when you saw the title of this video, you probably thought to yourself, well, he's gonna talk about the Death Star. And you're right. Constructed on the backs of Wookiee slaves and Geonosian hive mind workers, this impressive structure represented the accumulation of one man's ego and another man's small penis syndrome. At 160 kilometers in diameter, the first Death Star was probably the most ambitious construction project we've seen in the Star Wars galaxy. What made it even more impressive was how old Palpy McScrotum face was able to keep it all a secret. And it's not just the enormous size that makes it hard to hide the structure. As big as the Death Star is, space is even bigger, and there are plenty of nebulas to hide it in. And unlike most of the stations on this list, the Death Star actually could move around and travel at FTL speeds by itself. The thing that really made keeping the Death Star a secret so hard was the massive amount of resources that the construction required. You had really rare materials like dunium and kyber crystals, and then less rare but also huge quantities of durasteel. The cost of the Death Star was actually a significant portion of the Galactic Empire's GDP. And despite being a heavily government-controlled economy, the destruction of the Death Star most likely led to a huge financial recession. Which is just another terrible thing you can add onto the list of messed up things the Rebel Alliance did. To make matters even worse, the Empire decided to construct an even bigger Death Star after the destruction of the first one. Because maybe if you make it bigger, it'll be harder for the Rebels to destroy. Well, at 200 kilometers in diameter, not only was the main super laser larger, but so were the ventilation shafts in the structure. They were so big that not only could a small proton torpedo fly through it, an entire X-Wing and even a small Corellian freighter can make it through as well. The destruction of the second Death Star was enough to start the beginning of the end for the Empire, and led to the supposed death of Emperor Palpatine. Oh, by the way, if the reactor shaft Palpatine falls down, leads all the way to the reactor in the center of the ship, that would be a 100 kilometer fall, and if the air pressure and gravity inside of the Death Star is close or similar to Earth's, it would take roughly 30 minutes for him to reach the bottom. Although judging by the giant wave of angry energy coming from the shaft just moments after Palpatine is unceremoniously dumped down it, we can assume that he prematurely exploded, which is very common for a male Sith Lord at his age. The Covenant were a coalition of many different alien species united under a very strict hierarchy. Because of all the different alien races in the Covenant, it made sense that their capital wasn't on a planet, but on a mobile space station. This was known as the High Charity. This gigantic mushroom-like structure was built around the engine of an old Forerunner Dreadnought that had formerly been used by the alien species known as the Prophets in a war against the alien species known as the Elites. The two sides eventually made peace, and as a sign of goodwill, the Prophets decommissioned their giant Forerunner Dreadnought, and therefore the Covenant was created. The Forerunners were an elder race that had extremely advanced technology, but were eventually wiped out in a suicidal last stand against the parasitic Flood species. They were responsible for the giant super weapons known as the Halo Arrays across the galaxy. Now, High Charity was a massive space station. It had a width of 348 kilometers and a height of 505 kilometers. Armed with over 2,000 weapons emplacements and a slipstream drive, it could basically defend itself from almost any threat or escape if the station is being overwhelmed. Well, unless that threat is the Flood. They basically consume everything. In order to expand humanity's influence across the rest of our solar system and eventually our galaxy, we have to be able to create a large fleet of ships. One of the limiting factors of how large ships can be in our own world is our lack of orbital shipyards. 
Every spacecraft we design and construct must first escape the pole of our own planet first. In the not so far off future, the Terran Federation will safeguard humanity's home system with a gigantic orbital base known as Luna Base. This base is essentially a massive 6,000 kilometer ring that wraps around the moon at an average altitude of 300 kilometers. All throughout the ring are docks for various types of ships. The base serves as a construction, refitting, and staging point for the Terran Federation fleet. Since we mentioned the high charity, we're going to have to mention another piece of Halo technology, the Halos themselves. Known as the Sacred Rings by the Covenant, these were massive rings built to study and destroy the parasitic race known as the Flood. They did this mainly by destroying the Flood's main food source, which meant all organic life in the galaxy. There were seven rings in total, and the last time they were fired off was almost 100,000 years before the events of the Halo series. This attack was carried out by the Forerunners in a suicidal last-ditch effort to contain the Flood. The Halo rings themselves were massive. At 10,000 kilometers in diameter, they were just a few thousand meters smaller than the planet Earth. The inside of the rings were habitable and had gravity generated by the spinning motion of the entire structure. The Halo rings could fire a huge amount of radiation which would wipe out all organic life within a 25,000 light year radius. Now before we go to our last entry, let's look at some honorable mentions. First, there's Alpha from Valerian, the city of a thousand planets. In the future, humanity and various races we encountered would continue to build on top of the ISS. The International Space Station would sort of become a Hong Kong-like city for the entire Earth, opening up the rest of the planet to newly met alien races who wanted to form cultural and economic ties with humanity. Because of its modular design, Alpha was able to accommodate a wide range of species and their local environments. It eventually grew to such a large size that it had to be towed out of Earth's atmosphere so that it wouldn't deorbit. We're not really sure how large it is, but it was massive. In the film Interstellar, humanity is in danger as a plague threatens to wipe out all types of crops on Earth. Luckily, Matthew McConaughey falls into a black hole and figures out the secret of anti-gravity technology. The humans of Interstellar are able to create a gigantic O'Neill cylinder called Cooper Station. These gigantic ships would serve as arcs to take the rest of humanity away from the planet Earth to their new home amongst the stars. Star Wars has a lot of huge space stations and we just don't have enough time to cover them all, but there is one other one that I would like to mention. Quat Drive Yards. This was a massive orbital ring that surrounded the planet of Quat, and it was home to one of the largest and most prolific defense contractors in the galaxy. Quat Drive Yards was responsible for a wide range of vehicles from AT-ATs to Imperial Class Star Destroyers. The planet also had many subsidiaries, including Rothana Engineering, which was responsible for a lot of the Republic's main designs like the Venator Class Star Destroyer and the ATTE. The planet of Quant was around 10,000 kilometers in diameter, so Quad Drive Yards was even larger than that. The Dyson Sphere. Ah, Dyson, the company that brought you overpriced vacuum cleaners, hair dryers, and giant spheres that encase entire stars. This British tech company has come a long way by the 24th century. Okay, the Dyson Sphere in Star Trek The Next Generation wasn't actually designed by Dyson, but instead this guy. Freeman Dyson. Freeman Dyson postulated the theory that an enormous hollow sphere could be constructed around a star, harnessing all the radiant energy of that star. So he proposed a series of orbital structures that would collect all the energy from the star. Clever guy, although it's pretty much confirmed that he actually got the idea from this science fiction novel, Star Maker, written in 1937. Anyway, the Dyson Sphere that the Enterprise encounters in Star Trek The Next Generation is 200 million kilometers or 124 million miles in diameter, which is almost as big as our Earth's orbit around the Sun, which makes sense if you wanted to live on the interior surface of it and not get fried by solar radiation, assuming that it was built around a star the same size as our Sun. The interior surface would also be massive. The interior surface area of a sphere this size is the equivalent of more than 250 million Class M planets. And this all makes it the biggest space station in this video. If we can even call it a space station, space structure might be more appropriate. It's just a shame that it was featured on a show made back in the early 90s with a limited budget. The Dyson Sphere in the plot of that episode was abandoned, probably so they didn't need to show you the actual civilization living inside of it because they couldn't afford the special effects work. Just think how cool it would be depicted with modern special effects, kind of like a Yorktown on the inside and a Death Star on the outside. 
Guys, if you have been wondering where I've been for the past several months, I've actually been working on two of our other YouTube channels, The Credit Shifu and The Business Shifu. Now, The Credit Shifu teaches you how to improve your credit score um, and various techniques for using credit cards to earn points to get free flights. It's gonna be really interesting for people who live in the USA. It's aimed towards that audience, so you guys might wanna check that out. Uh, the Business Shifu is more of a universal channel about entrepreneurship and business and that's our new channel. So I'm gonna put the link to that on the end of this video for you guys to check out. We've got about three videos up there now. Um, so I'm gonna end it. What does Alan normally say at the end of these videos? I don't know, I can't remember. Oh well, whatever. We'll see you next time and please subscribe to Generation Films. Bye-bye.